new edition. <laughs> it's a crazy book. And it was just from his notes that he took and like, oh, there's no really good dictionary, I'll write one. He was halfway through the Chinese to English dictionary when he died. He fell for this concept and they were there in the Philippines using chemical fertilizer, NPK, and here's the rates that they were putting down, how to get high yields and, you know, be the good manager, like it's pictures here in their little graph, and if you use fertilizers, it lowers costs and it increases profits. Sounds good. Let's use it. And he told uh, later in his life, when he was older, he met Lynn Hogue, and he told Lynn Hogue, if I'd have done anything different, I would have done it organically. I wouldn't have done what I did. Like, you know, with Mitlider and everything, with the chemical fertilizers. But, you know, they got to the Philippines, and here these guys were like, hey, these are the sweet potatoes that we're growing now. But, oh, look at all this chemical fertilizer. Now you can grow sweet potatoes like this. But they were, you know, pretty much void of nutrients. Probably didn't taste very good. Um, they grew 12-foot high corn plants. They were super excited. And um, it was looking like, this is 1950, that we were going to feed food for everyone. We we're going to feed the world with this new chemical agro business. Fast forward to today, now, we have, now we're messing with the very genes of plants to the untold detriment of our food supply. Um, we really don't know what we've unleashed. Um, like the papayas, most papayas are genetically modified and they say even all, most of the organic crops have now been contaminated. So it's something that's spreading and contaminating um, those same crops. Uh, they basically genetically engineered the plant to withstand spraying glyphosate on it so that it could kill all the weeds and they could still bring you a soybean or bring you uh, whatever it is, they're, the peas or whatever it is they're growing you uh, for you and it's soaked in glyphosate. The corn and the cotton are both Bt cotton and Bt corn which produces a toxin called Bt toxin so when bugs eat it, they die. So I wonder what that's doing to your gut health. Um, so they do this just literally so they can pr spray this stuff, glyphosate, all over everything. Um, we've sprayed basically 80% of all our crops with it in the United States. And for 40 years, they said it's basically as safe as table salt. Isn't that crazy? For 40 years, they said it's as safe as table salt. You can eat it. These are all the crops that it's sprayed on. It's more than just the genetically modified crops. They spray it on grains and seeds to desiccate the crop to dry it down so they can get it to market quicker. Um, everything basically that you eat. Just in my lifetime, like I was born down here in the grass on this graph, 1976, 10 years later, we were spraying 4,000 tons of glyphosate on the ground. By 2007, we were spraying 80,000 tons. That's a 2,000% increase. And it's still doing this, still going up. They've made it illegal in Europe and places. I mean, they know what the, what the detriment is of this stuff, and yet we're still using it. These are the five top tested foods with the most glyphosate. Stace, er, uh, uh, Cheerios, number one. 1,125 parts per billion. If you're eating Cheerios, you are consuming glyphosate. Stacy's simple naked pita chips. I looked over and there were, they were in the corner in my own kitchen. Honey Nut Cheerios, 670 parts per million. Now this is parts per billion. They have found that one part per trillion affects gene expression and, and you know, causes cancer. California is de deemed that it causes cancer. And, and every, every else in the world um, has deemed that it causes cancer. Doritos, kettle, uh, Lay's potato chips doused in glyphosate. It's an endocrine disruptor, and your endocrine system is all these um, organs in your body that, pr that run everything, control everything from, your, from your, your growth to your mood to your uh, uh, digestion. Every, I mean, so much is happening with hormones and things that are being produced by your endocrine system. You don't want to disrupt that system. Basically, they've said that the uh, glyphosate is safe because plants have a sugar mate pathway and that's how glyphosate works. It blocks, it comes in, it blocks the sugar mate pathway, the plant dies, and humans don't have the sugar mate pathway. And we don't, we don't have it. So therefore it's safe, safe as table salt. The only problem is your gut bacteria do. They have the sugar mate pathway and they begin to kill 
your gut bacteria. Every bit of glyphosate we eat kills your gut bacteria. These little guys are in charge of so much, um, you know, you're 10 times more bacteria than you have cells in your body, and they are doing metabolic processes in your gut, that of a vital organ. They're first, you're, this is your first line of defense for your immune system. They kill pathogenic uh, bacteria, molds and yeast, they keep those in check. They produce all sorts of vitamins, vitamin B12 and 7, and vitamin K. Um, uh, they actually, this is something new I learned, they, they modulate your inflammation response. So they, they, they're the things that turn off your inflammation after you've had an injury or whatever. It's your gut bacteria that turn off inflammation. Well, what's everybody suffering from? Inflammation. That's the start of every disease. If, if they're not there to turn it off, we've got chronic inflammation throughout the population. So these bacteria die. Um, this is a diagram of your gut. So what's above? This is the epithelial lining of your gut. Above that is your intestines. Below that is your bloodstream. And these gut bacteria that reside right up against the wall of your, um, pictured on the left here, they basically take the fiber from sweet potatoes and starchy foods and they make mucus. That's where your mucus lining comes from, is from eating starchy foods. It's called fermentable fiber. And the bacteria ferment that fiber, basically, they process it, and they produce all this mucus, this big, thick mucus. That's what you need. Because there's other bacteria going down through your gut, eating other things, and they would love to get to your bloodstream, but this is your last line of defense right here, these bacteria um, protecting your gut. If we kill them, they don't produce the mucus. The mucus gets thin. Opportunists get up against the lining of your gut. They irritate the gut. They get in between the epithelial cells, and they start to leak into your bloodstream. They leak toxins and poisons, and um, microbes can leak into your, and food particles can leak into your bloodstream, and this is what's causing leaky gut. And this causes an inflammatory response. It's unchecked, and it can move to the brain. They found that every person, every kid on the autistic scale is suffering from an inflammatory bowel and inflammatory brain disorder of some sort. And um, it affects your brain. These bacteria also take important amino acids that you take in through your food, tyrosine, tryptophan. These are things you eat, and they make dopamine and serotonin. 90% of the serotonin that your body needs is made in your gut. There is a gut-brain connection that is absolutely phenomenal. There is more fibers in your gut, nerve uh, uh, endings and fibers in your gut than there are in your entire spinal cord. So once it splits out and goes into your gut, it's like literally, they call it the second brain, right? So if you're not, if you don't have these bacteria in your gut and you're not making serotonin, you're not a happy person. You're, you're clinically depressed, typically. Um, you're irritable, uh, you know, it, it has everything to do with your mood. Isn't that interesting? I think Satan knows that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, quite literally. Um, every cell in your body has what's called, an or there's an organelle called the mitochondria. Where's my seniors? You guys know what the mitochondria do? And the sophomores and the freshmen. And the sophomores and the freshmen. Open to anybody. What does the what's the main purpose of the mitochondria? It's an organelle in the cell. <laughs> okay, the main function of, the, of this organelle is to synthesize what? Three letters, like, you know, three capital letters. ATP. Remember that? Okay, ATP, energy, right? This is the, this is the engine of every cell in your body is a mitochondria that's the engine of you. And glyphosate disrupts the function of the mitochondria, and it doesn't produce as much energy. And, you know, you hear people talking about brain fog, like, oh, man, I just have brain fog today. I just can't really, whew, can't even remember my, what my name is. Uh, remember, the brain takes up 5% of the body's mass, but it uses 25% of its energy at rest. 
at rest. So when you're thinking and you, you're needing to think and you're needing to work some problem out, you're, you're, you, you, know, you need to bring something to God, your, your brain's going to be using way more energy than that. If the energy's not there, it's not there. If your mitochondria are disrupted, it's not there. Look at just the rates of disease as, a, as um, uh, the introduction of glyphosate really started to ramp up just in my lifetime. This is just, these charts are just from 95 to 2010. Most people say, oh, you know what? Correlation doesn't equal causation. That'd be true for one graph. But when there's more, uh, tons into all of a sudden, you know, I think we have a little bit of data here uh, that kind of says the same thing. Um, here's obesity death rates, climbing right lockstep with, with uh, the use of glyphosate thyroid cancer, hypertension, inflammatory bowel disease, insomnia, kidney cancer, liver cancer, Alzheimer's death, anxiety. If you have to think about how anxious people are, you know, especially now with what's going on. There was a little bright uh, light of hope uh, against Monsanto here in, two, in uh, May 13, 2019. Um, a couple years ago, a jury awarded $2 billion to a couple uh, in a lawsuit against Monsanto for uh, basically proving that him using glyphosate his whole life um, caused his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the cancer typically that causes all types of cancer, but that's the one that pops up the most. The other thing that was taking place during the same time period, uh, from the 80s to, to even now and still, still going, is the use of vaccines. Uh, when I was a kid, there was literally like maybe six or seven vaccines um, for five or six diseases. Uh, anybody familiar with what the schedule is today? How many vaccines? 45? Starting at like literally your first day of birth kind of a thing. Um, 45 vaccines for like 18 diseases, something ridiculous. Um, when I was a kid, I think it was one in 10,000 were autistic. You know what it is today? It's one in 43. They say if we continue on this trajectory, it's going to be every other boy born will be autistic. Who's going to take care of all these people? This is like insane what's happening. I mean, we're seriously living in the twilight zone. This is a graph just showing the introduction of the hepatitis B vaccine into France. They started vaccinating their population in 84. It took a little while to get the program going. By 89, they were really ramping it up. And they all of a sudden noticed that uh, the uh, post vaccine onset of multiple sclerosis was climbing lockstep with the use of this vaccine. This is a vaccine they purchased from America, by the way. And they said, by 1995, they're like, this is ridiculous. What are we going to do? Are we just going to keep doing this? And so they quit. And it took a while for it to work its way out of the system, but instantly, almost lockstep fashion, the post vaccine onset of multiple sclerosis started to go away and went down to virtually zero by them not uh, using this vaccine. So here we are in this situation with this virus that's called COVID. And COVID attaches to a receptor on your cell called the ACE2 receptor. This is where it attaches and then it empties its genetic contents into your cell and your cell uh, ends up making and replicating the virus for the virus because it can't, it's not alive, it can't do it itself. It needs a, it needs a host to replicate. Um, the biggest thing in the news, I just was listening to the news this last week and they're still, uh, where did this thing come from? Like, did it leak out of a lab accidentally or did it come from nature? Well, we kind of really, we're leaning more towards it came from nature. But if you really look um, at it, it, it I, don't, I don't think it came from nature. Um, this is the spike protein on, this is the thing that attaches to humans. And basically these three sites on here, uh, it, this says the spike protein um, is what makes it possible for the SARS-CoV-2 to attach and infect human cells. The spike protein has three unique regions not found in any other coronavirus. One of them is borrowed from the HIV pseudovirus glycoprotein 120. So that's that's put in there from um, the HIV virus. This proline arginine, um, arginine alanine insert, they say it takes like 12 different steps to get that insert to attach. Never would that just happen in nature. Like this, this is a bat virus, 
with this spike protein that now infects humans. And then there's a, pro, a, pro, a prion-like domain on the top of the, re, of the, of the receptor site that um, if you know anything about prions, I mean, this is what causes mad cow disease. So probably don't want those floating around in your system. Um, make, this is called making chimeric coronavirus spike proteins. This is called gain-of-function research. There was a moratorium placed on this type of research in 2006 in this country. We don't want to do this anymore. We don't need to do this. Why do this? And um, yet these two researchers on the right, they basically, through the back doors and whatnot and other agencies and whatever, um, funneled fun funds to the Wuhan Institute where this Xi Jing Li, who was known as the Bat Lady, um, was, doing, was continuing this same gain-of-function research. And I mean, this is them writing about it in the Journal of Virology. We, meaning those people there that I just pictured, recently isolated a bat cove strain and constructed an infectious clone of another strain. Significantly, these strains are closely related to the SARS cove and capable of using the same cellular receptor, the ACE2. So here they are talking about it. This is what it does. The virus attaches to your ACE2 receptor. And the funding, HHS, NIH, and uh, National Institutes for Health, the NIH provided funding to Peter Dayzak and Xi Zing Li. I mean, it's right there. It says their names. This is the grant number. Um, you can go look this up. I mean, it's crazy. 50% of this country has vaccinated themselves with an mRNA vaccine that is completely experimental. No one really knows what the effect of this is going to be. VAERS, have you heard of VAERS? VAERS is the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. It's a system to report vaccine injury. They did a study in the late 80s, early 90s, how well is this system doing? They said, well, it's reporting less than 1% of the injuries. So less than 1% one, uh, less than 1 of the injury, vaccine injuries have been reported. And there's a big pushback. Doctors even like have said they've tried to enter injuries into the system, and it kicks it back and won't let them enter it. There was a, an act that was passed in 1986 called the National Vaccine Injury Act. Is anybody familiar with that act? What's that sound like? National Vaccine Injury Act. We're going to protect you, right, from injury? Actually, it protected the vaccine makers from being sued if someone was injured. That's what the act is for. And um, because they, they stay, say that vaccines are not drugs, they are biologics, they don't have to go through the same safety studies as drugs. They don't. These little clinical trials you heard about that the, that the coronavirus went through, they, they compare uh, Vaccines versus vaccines and things. They're not comparing just straight vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's really strange. Uh, why has 50% of the population gone out to take a vaccine that has a, they're telling us 1.8% mortality rate. Okay, it's significant. 0.6% is what the mortality rate was here in Utah. And basically the answer is fear, right? I mean, it's constant fear. At first it was two and a half mortal or comorbidities and you're going to go into the hospital. Well, pff, pretty much everybody had two and a half, you know. You had uh, a little bit of a weight issue, this and that. You're pre-diabetic. You have heart disease. I mean, I mean, everybody's suffering from something. And especially if you're just eating a regular uh, all-American diet. But you know, God didn't give us the spirit of fear, right? For God has given us not has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? Amen. Because see, the, t the attack really here is the mind. That's what is under attack. When you attack through the food, the gut, you're attacking the brain. Um, the vaccine is, they're saying it's not a vaccine. They're saying that it's an experimental gene therapy. It basically is this... Uh, slew of nucleic acid that they inject into you that has a bunch of DNA injected into a vector that goes into your cell and puts this piece of DNA into your cell and has your cell crank out the spike protein. It's like how quickly, how, how, how did they get this thing made so quickly? They already knew. They've been doing this for 10 years. This chimeric research has been going on for 10 years. So 
I think they kind of maybe do or something because but you go and look on the internet and it'll be nothing but oh this is a bunch of hogwash you know the the newest anti-vax talking point um, is is just as much different disinformation as other anti-vax talking points it claims that the mRNA vaccine are not really vaccines but medical devices and gene therapy or experimental biologics and they falsely are classified as vaccines in order to bypass safety testing well I mean that's what they did <laughs> They changed the wording to, for it to not be a vaccine. The best mask of all against this virus is, of course, a healthy immune system. We know that, right? Healthy people aren't getting sick. They're not going to the hospital. They're not dying. What if I told you there was a golden key to your immune system? Would you use it? What if I told you if you didn't use it, you're at risk of all sorts of issues from cancer to not being able to synthesize calcium into your bones. Uh, basically, there's a receptor site on every single cell in your body for this one key. It go, and it works in your, the nucleus of your cell for over, with, and helps with over 2,000 gene expressions. It's vitamin D. Isn't that amazing? Something that your body needs that you get from the sun. That's pretty incredible, really. Uh, it actually only takes about 20 minutes a day of sun exposure to create enough vitamin D for your body's needs. Problem is, it's 20 minutes a day in your birthday suit. I've done that a few times, but not a lot. <laughs> and it would behoove us to do that, but we don't. So we are all vitamin D deficient. I mean, literally, the 80% of the population of the planet is vitamin D deficient. Some, even, even some will say 90% if you wear, it, wear your cut off the threshold. But what an amazing lesson for us, really. The best thing for our immune system is to expose ourselves to the sun every day. What a beautiful lesson. And really, I mean, I think the lesson really tell, t tells us 20 minutes. I mean, just it gives us a starting point. Just start with 20 minutes. If it seems overwhelming to you and you, you know, like, oh, I don't know where to start, what to read, what to pray about, start with just 20 minutes. And then work it up to 20 minutes of prayer and 20 minutes of Bible study. Expose yourself to the sun. Because when you do, you gain a divinely directed determination in your life. All of a sudden, God takes a hold of your life. When you're, when you're fully operational and everything is running, all your little mitochondria are kicking at high speed and every cell in your body has a vitamin D because you've exposed yourself to the sun that day, you will have a divinely directed determination in your life. Because we can't do it ourselves, we get ourselves into trouble. The other uh, source of vitamin D, like the vegan sources, um, come from mushrooms. And I looked up, how much, how much is vitamin D is in a mushroom? Well, because they grow the mushrooms in the dark, the bu button mushrooms really could have the highest amount, but they don't. You literally have to eat eight six-ounce packages to get the amount of vitamin D you need for the day. You're not going to eat that much uh, mushroom. And, but if you get a little grow light, little UV grow light, and you put them under the light for... 12 hours during the night, you can get enough vitamin D in just four or five mushrooms. It increases the amount of vitamin D. Isn't that amazing? Mushrooms are synthesizing vitamin D? We're like mushrooms? The mushroom guy, I mean, I don't believe this, but the, uh, the Paul Stamets guy that we buy the mushroom stuff from, his theory is that we evolved from mushrooms. <laughs> I don't think we evolved from mushrooms, but I think the mushrooms tell us something very interesting, that, that um, this, I mean, they're, they're, there's this thing that, that help the forest in so many ways. They decay dead trees and plant matter, and they deliver that to others. They communicate plants between each other. They deliver a pine tree can give a little baby pine tree over there food from itself. 
through mycelium in the soil. It's amazing. I think we're called to be like that, like a network of help and service underground, something that's not even seen. I mean, there's, you, you could just go on and on. I mean, the lessons are all there. The book of nature is absolutely phenomenal. This is just a chart of just um, vitamin D deficiencies. Um, and you know, you, don't, you, can just not, you can't just look at somebody and say, oh, you look healthy, you're probably fine. I thought I was fine and I had a massive uh, staph infection that put me in the hospital and afterwards, Dr. Arnott took me on and he tested my blood and he found, he goes, man, look at these numbers. Your numbers are absolutely amazing. This is like the best cholesterol and this and that. I mean, I don't see numbers like this very often. This is obviously, you know, your vegan diet's doing well here, but, uh, uh, but look at this. Your vitamin D is 23 and your B12 is in the basement as well. If you continue keeping your level at 23, he's all, you're staring cancer in the face. And I went, okay, I'll take a supplement. And I started on a supplement that year, a year before I moved here. So I'd been vitamin D deficient my whole life. If you are vitamin D deficient, you are immune suppressed. That's basically what it says. Um, the spread is interesting between... Um, different nationalities, white people are 5% are less than 20, whereas um, Hispanics are 20%, a mi other mix are 26%, blacks are 41%. The darker your skin, the harder it is for you to synthesize D3 from the sun. So they're actually more um, deficient. It's just uh, a basic part of biology, basically. And most of everybody is um, in this 23 to 30 nanograms per milliliter range, you need to be at 100. Not over 100, but at 100. Like, that's where you want to be. That's, that's what Dr. Arnott told me is you want to just push it to 100 as close as you possibly can. Um, it even says here, optimal levels 50 to 70. Treat cancer and heart disease 70 to 100. Well, why wouldn't we want to just live there? <laughs> right? Why not prevent heart disease and cancer? up your vitamin D level and do that, right? Almost every system, whoops, went too fast there. Every system in the body can suffer from an ad, uh, adverse effects from vitamin D deficiency. High blood pressure, coronary disease, asthma, wheezing, cancer, influenza, rickets. And when you start to add vitamin D into the situation, all these diseases go down. This is proven science that they've done these double blind studies with vitamin D and they have shown, they, even in this pandemic, they showed in other countries, double-blind double placebo studies, that increasing, just mid-range vitamin D reduced your risk of going into the hospital with clinical symptoms by 90%. Just vitamin D. Now, and that's not everything, but magnesium and zinc, magnesium plays a delicate role with, with vitamin D. You've got to have magnesium um, to work with, with uh, vitamin D. And these are things you get in your food, right? Um, almonds and cashews, flax seeds, oatmeal, broccoli, and the pea sprouts are high in magnesium. Uh, zinc, you have pumpkin seeds and hemp seeds, avocados, lentils, chickpeas. Again, almonds and cashews, mushrooms have zinc. So just eating right is obviously important as well. But vitamin D is something really special. It's, it shows us this. I think it, it's almost like it's a, an end time revelation here of science showing us Expose yourself to the sun. Expose yourself to the sun. And you will have the best health. Because, you know, we're living in a time where people are, and you know what, I had a bunch of scriptures I was supposed to look up in some of those slides. I'm going to just go through them. I have four scriptures here we can look up. Turn to Romans 12. Verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, 
it really does matter. I mean, we, were, we are what we eat. We know that. And we know that Satan is alive and well, and he has studied the human mind. He's learned to know it better than, than we know it. And in these last days, he is trying to put his character on people, right? It's, it's either you're gonna, we're going to have his character or we're going to receive God's character, right? The seal. And I think people are waking up to the fact that, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea to just live to eat and eat all these foods that just cause an inflammatory. I mean, every single one of these foods on the left here is inflammatory in its, in its nature. But yet, you know, eat to live and eat for the purpose of energy and vitality, knowing that we're in the last days. This thing is about to wrap up. And I think we need to be serious about um, what we put not only in our bodies, but in our minds, right? I mean, that's why it's important what we see, what we watch. Go to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, we're just going to read the first six verses there in Proverbs 3. My son, forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to you. Health will be added to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them upon the tables of your heart so that you find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and men. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Exposing ourselves to the sun fully arms our immune system. That's, I mean, the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual one. And it goes, the verse in Ephesians goes on to say, therefore put on what? The whole armor, the full armor of God, right? And if you look at every single piece of that armor, it's all vitamin D. It's all Jesus, right? I mean, it's the helmet of salvation. Who's your salvation? It's the breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness is yours? No, right, it's his. It's the belt of truth. He is the truth, the way, and the life, right? We have the shield of faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus. It's the sword in your hand. It's the word. He is the living word. The gospel of peace, the shoes that we wear on our feet, he is the one who is directing our paths. Ephesians. Go back over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 8, and 9. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Literally, we are children of the light. We need the light. The little mitochondria are putting out energy. I mean, it's like they're, they're transferring light that plants have put into carbohydrates that we then convert back into energy. I mean, it's this amazing cycle that's showing us we have to be connected every day to the one who is the source of all life. Last verse, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. The battle is for the mind, therefore we must have the mind of Christ if we're going to be successful in this battle. We can't do it on our own. For he has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. So as we go through this weekend, the take-home take point here is to just remember 
that daily, if we expose ourselves to the sun, we have nothing to fear, man-made virus or not, right? Satan's electronic messages or not, we will be protected if we expose ourselves daily to the sun. Let's pray. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for your word and for the book of nature, for the lessons that we can learn even in our own physiology, the lesson of, of this hidden war that's going on that we cannot see, modeled by the bacterium in our gut. And so, Lord, we, we need legions of angels to come to be around us each and every day. And I just pray for um, each person here that we will remember to daily expose ourselves to the sun, to the sun of righteousness, the one who created us, who knows us better than we know ourselves. And that if we do, he will protect us, and not only protect us, but he will give us a divinely directed determination in our life, that we will be directed by him to go out into the world and to share the last message of mercy, because Lord, you're about to come. We know you're about to come. And so, Lord, we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Please be with us as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing another song, or is that it? That's the end? Closing prayer. I guess you just missed the piano music, you know? It's, it's kind of quiet. Yeah, you want to play some piano music? Why would we want that? <laughs>